It's 1.30 p.m. in Lagos, same time in London, and we're bringing you markets, analysis, and insights on Business Incorporated, live from Channels TV. And here's what's coming up on the program. Zimbabwe maintains tight monetary policy as inflation drops to 18.4%. In South Sudan and Russia, set to expand energy ties. And in Nigeria, FAC shares 1.1 trillion naira's August revenue to federal government, states, and local governments. Welcome to the program. I'm Willy Bong. Let's kick off, as always, with market numbers. First up, we're making major, major equities in Africa. We're at intraday. Equities were mixed. We're talking about Nigeria and South Africa. We see Nigeria down marginally at intraday, 0.03% at 66,000 points. South Africa, however, was in the green, 0.45%. The stocks are trading in opposite directions. Now, Egypt, however, is closed Thursday. It was, well, it was closed in the red, down 0.89%. And Kenya also closed yesterday's session is on the losing streak notching three days of losses now it's down yesterday 0.5 percent now we're bringing in Abdul Rashid Momos, equity trader TLW stockbrokers is going to be giving us what's going on at the NGX today's the final trading day of September it ends the last quarter I mean the, the third quarter and we'll see how stocks are doing uh, good afternoon Abdul Rashid uh, good to have you on the show thank you very much can you hear me I can hear you uh, Abdul Rashid, what's going on right now? Today is the final trading day. What's going on with stocks? What stocks are moving? The NGX, why are we still in the red? Uh, an analyst I spoke to this morning said we'll be, we'll be ending in the green, but what's going on? Uh, it might not be far from the truth. You know, today is a very special day for the market, which we, we, we call it the end of quarter. If you see, uh, mostly end of quarters normally bring out a lot of um those are these are periods where you see a lot of mutual funds or uh, big players trying to re reclassify their equities and these are periods where we see a lot of kind of window dressing happening uh but so far as we speak we've not seen that but the only thing i can tell you that we are beginning, we are beginning to see higher volumes especially the banking sector right trading for now, we are beginning to see um, in terms of the banks, uh, and I think Fidelity, Access, Wema, Transcorp, and Unity Bank for, for now, that's where um, money seems to be flowing into the market for now. I think uh, Jitco and Dank Sugar. So, but you know, normally, um, if I want to analyze the market based on technicals, what has just happened is market is taking a correction all the all the rallies we've had in the period of august have been um we are back to square one back to all what we made in august september has taken it out and um the market now is within a support level you know so what we need to watch is is the market going to break this support level or there will be a rebound that should be the i mean concern for most investors now so when you talk about volume in terms of for the banking sector, are you talking about buy interest or sell-offs going on? Yeah, buying interest. Uh, you see, the way the market plays out, we've only, I always say we always have two players, the investors and the traders. Um, if you look at the traders, um, most of the financials, the dividend payouts have been announced. But before the dividend payout, we saw um price spikes uh let me give example let's say ub has marked down for for now um by the time ub announced it was around it's around 14 naira so it got about uh, 17 18 naira or let's say they announced around 15. so if you look at the the, the, the interim we were going to pay was about 50 cobo compared to this uh, spike in price you see that the traders will prefer to have taken out um, they would have preferred the price appreciation than dividend. But as it is, you know, even just if you take your price appreciation, for the investors in the long term, it's still a buy. But for now, you know, what will interest you now is that the traders are not seeing the kind of rallies we are seeing now, you know. So the strategy is for them to be buying into the dips. The, in, the investors too are waiting for the next financials because we know automatically most of these companies are doing well in the market 
So they'll be waiting for the next financial and also buying in the deep. So as, as it is, and that's why we are not seeing uh, much um, rallies in the past because everybody wants to buy at a lower price. So the correction we are seeing now is healthy. I always tell people that the market cannot keep going up all the time. There must always be a time for correction so that for those who miss the boss, they'll, be, they'll have the opportunity to enter again. Uh, so access uh, holdings, uh, is, it, is access holdings still being punished by investors? I think it closed about 15 Naira uh, yesterday. So what's uh, the share price going at right now? As you speak, access is going for, the last traded price is about 15.80. Overall, bid and offer is about 19 to about 18 million. And um, so far, the market has traded about, um, market has traded about 14 million. You know, if you compare the volumes now with what we had then, you, you imagine this is this are more of a surface scratch. We see a lot of investors when market is actually going up, right? Well, when market is flat, right? Um, you, this is where you actually see professionals playing the game. You know, the market is flat now. So what people need to watch out is just watch out for in support with resistant levels for your entry and exit point. As it is now, um, a lot of people are actually by the uh, by the fence just waiting for what is going to happen next because um, um, some people have sold into strength and some people are buying based on dividend payout. Example, um, UBA and GT that have marked down for dividends Yes, yes, they are not within the current price, but you can see that we still have um, buyers and sellers still interested in in this current stock. I mean, the share price. Because for me, I know in the long term, um, with the index within the 6,000 points, if you compare them to what we had in 2008, the, most of these stocks, especially the banking sectors, are not close to what they were then. So there's still room for an uptrend, but for now, uh, it's more of a um, cautious buy. Mm, well, cautious buy and investors are fearful. We'll watch out for that and see how the market closes today, and we'll see how the next quarter uh, begins, hopefully on a positive note. Thank you so much, Abdul Rashid Momo, equity trader, TLW Thank you. Stockbrokers. Thank you very much. Now let's see how markets uh, are faring at, uh, in the Middle East, although they closed yesterday. We see, let's see their closing numbers for yesterday. Uh, Abu Dhabi was down yesterday, 0.27%. Uh, Dubai down 0.52%. Let's see what Saudi and Qatar did. Also in the red, 0.19% and Qatar 0.12%. Now, in the EU, Germany has seen its lowest inflation rate since the beginning of the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine. The breakdown, to break these numbers down, we're joined Joined by Deutsche Welle's uh, Cassandra Sonte in Berlin. Cassandra, inflation hit a four and a half percent in September. Can you tell us more about what this means? Thanks for having me, Will. That's right. Uh, the figure of 4.5% is indeed the lowest inflation rate we've seen here in Germany since the start of the full-scale Ukraine war. That figure is looking at prices in the month of September compared to September of last year. And to be clear, inflation is still rising at nearly twice the rate that most economists would like. It's just rising more slowly than before. So with that caveat out of the way, the 4.5% inflation figure is down compared to the previous month. The August reading was 6.1% year-on-year. Part of what led to this overall inflation rate going down a bit was slower energy price increases. Inflation there was just 1%, but food price inflation is still quite high at 7.5%. Uh, we know that Germany's economy has been struggling to get back on its feet since not only since the start of the war, but you know, before during the whole pandemic recovery. Stepping back, what are other indicators telling us about the state of Germany's economy? 
Yeah, that phrase, uh, the quote, sick man of Europe, got thrown around again this summer as analysts were talking about Germany. There's always a bit of a worry within Europe when Germany isn't doing well, because despite some of these economic difficulties that come with higher energy prices since the start of the war in Ukraine, Germany is still the top economy in Europe. So it has a really big impact on the rest of the continent. Now, Germany is typically an industrial powerhouse. And right now, there is weakness in the very important manufacturing sector. Sector. But it's not just the domestic economy that is a challenge here. There are other global challenges for the German economy moving forward, principally a slow recovery from the pandemic for Germany's top trading partner, that would be China, as well as other problems in the global economy. Now, one look from an updated joint forecast predicts that the German economy will shrink by 0.6% for the whole of 2023. In fact, the IMF has predicted that Germany will be the only major advanced economy to shrink this year. Mm. Now, turning to the EU markets, uh, what are traders looking out for today, Cassandra? Right. European shares rose on Friday's opening, helped by gains in the luxury stocks. LVMH and Hermes both gained 2.3%. Investors seemed focused also on a slew of end-of-quarter economic data. Now, the stock 600 index climbed 0.6% on the opening. Germany's DAX has been lagging behind regional peers with a 4.6% loss. The London benchmark FTSE 100 rose 0.6%. 3%. Meanwhile, the Paris CAC 40 increased half a point. Thanks so much, Cassandra Sands from Berlin, giving us the updates. Now we'll turn our attention to the U.S. where stock futures were mixed on Friday morning as investors prepared to end a difficult September. Futures tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average added 0.49%. We see the Nasdaq 100 futures adding 0.72% and S&P 500 up or more than half a percent. Now, the major averages are also on pace for the modest losses on, for the week. The S&P 500 is off about 0.5%, while the Dow is down 0.9%. That's for the week. Now, NASDAQ is also off by 0.1%. Investors are now turning their attention to the latest personal consumption expenditures price index reading due later today. Now, in Asia markets, it's largely uh, in climbing in final trading day of the week with Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index leading gains in the region and rising 2.67% in the final hour of trade. Now, this comes as traders assess a key economic data out of Japan, including the September inflation rate for Tokyo. Uh, the capital's data is seen as a leading indicator of the nationwide trends. Tokyo Consumer Price Index rose 2.8% in September from a year ago, softening from the 2.9% gain in August. Now, Japan also saw unemployment, industrial output, and retail sales data for August. Now, Japan's Nikkei 225 fell marginally, extending losses from Thursday to finish at 31,000. 857 points, uh, while the topics dropped 0.94%. Now, in Australia, the S&P uh, 200 advanced 0.34% to end at 7,048 points after rebounding from a three-day losing streak. South Korea and the mainland Chinese markets are closed for a holiday. Now, oil prices fell in early trade on Friday after a recent rally as profit-taking and Expectations of supply increases by Russia and Saudi Arabia outweighed forecasts of positive demand from China during its Golden Week holiday. Brent November futures, which expire on Friday, were down 21 cents uh, to $95.17 per barrel. Brent December futures lost 10 cents to trade at $93 per barrel, while the U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude futures uh, fell 8 cents to $91.63 per barrel. All prices at ease about 1% on Thursday as traders took profits after prices soared to 10-month highs and some worried that high interest rates may weigh on oil demand. Now, more to come. Conversations on how Africa can raise money to fund its infrastructure. That conversation next. Do stay with us. This is Business Incorporated. Welcome back. Now, Emerging Africa 
private equity has dominated the investment landscape for decades. We've seen huge venture capital deals in the tech sector. Now, in addition to that, we've seen private debt is starting to emerge as an alternative asset class, and it's looking more attractive. Uh, for Latomi Fayemi, investment specialist 91, the fund manager of Emerging Africa Infrastructure, joins us. And good afternoon, for Latomi. It's good to have you on the show. Good afternoon. Now, private debt is becoming more attractive as an asset class in Africa. What is the benefit of investing with a private debt fund for infrastructure in, on the continent? Yeah, I think, uh, you, let's take a step back a bit. We see that private debt as an asset class uh, just across the globe has been rallying and a lot of people have taken interest in it. I think from our perspective, if we take EIF, there's a couple of different uh, key factors that we see um, that enables it to be a strong uh, area for growth. So EIF, uh, Emerging African Infrastructure Fund, is a blended finance vehicle. So when an investor goes and, and puts money into EIF, you have the advantage of strong cap, uh, a strong track record. So as you said, 20 years of, of work and investments we've done, you also have the ability to have a diversified portfolio as well as a strong team and you end up having uh, assets, quality assets, which have good and strong cash flows as well as mitigated, uh, mitigated risk. Because what ends up happening is you have a risk um, that is perceived as higher than it actually is. In fact, our portfolio is has a loss ratio of that of an investment grade portfolio, so of a triple B, but with sovereign risk baked in uh, at B-rated assets. So there's a bit of a dislocation that allows you to have a strong risk adjusted return. Well, you talked about risk right now. You, and I'm just looking at you. The, the the, the private debt cuts across different sectors. You can, you know, you know, give money for energy, transportation, agriculture, mining, and so on. But the currency risk that you learn in mostly USD and the euro, is that not a factor for African countries that are trying, you know, drowning in debt from, you know, high interest rates? I think that's a very good point. Uh, EIF actually does not only do uh, hard currency lending, so USD, Euro, but we actually also lend in, in uh, local currency. So we've actually done a couple of local currency bonds, um, for example, and we've also uh, done that whether it's in the Zof region, so that's in West Africa, or even in Kenya shilling. So there is the optionality. Yes, high interest rates is something that concerns every investor, but I think that that's not something that's really focused on Africa alone. I think across the globe, high interest rates is affecting many emerging markets. So I wouldn't say it's a phenomenon that's deterring investors uh, and high African countries only. I think the high interest rates are just making it uh, just a generally tougher environment to, to carry out deals. And so if this is a, an issue, definitely would have some challenges in attracting capital, especially if we don't, they don't get a return on their investments. What are some of the barriers that you find for attracting such investments into Africa? I think uh, we went about, uh, over it a bit, but from my perspective, I think risk perception is quite high. So there's a view that if you come into Africa and you're doing investments on the continent, you have the risk of losing your money. In actuality, that's not uh, really factual. We see that, you know, the loss ratios on African infrastructure are actually much lower than the rest of the emerging markets regions, and it's just slightly higher than that of developed markets. Many investors, when they come into Africa, you're working with strong, reputable sponsors. You're working on, with bankable contracts and bankable projects, which then ensures that the risk mitigation is there. In fact, if we take a step further in the amount of renewable energy deals that we've done, the EIF over its more than 20 year history have done over 35 uh, the power projects. And of the third, over 35 that we've done, we've actually never lost an investment. So you have lower loss ratios. So I think, you know, investing in in uh, vehicles like EIF are different ways to actually solve that problem. I think the barrier is there, but I also believe that there are solutions in place 
um, with blended pri uh, finance vehicles and as well as private debt vehicles that can actually help solve that issue. I do understand that this private debt, you work with businesses, you know, private businesses. I want to know if government's involvement are at play here. Do you collaborate with the government to get this done? Yes, in fact. So many of the projects that we do, uh, the power project, let's say a solar project, we do that under a PPP framework. So a private and public partnership framework, which effectively you take you work alongside off-takers and private entities to carry out a deal. So many of the uh, projects that we do are like that, and that's actually the preferred way for investors to, to invest in such project finance. So what can be done? We want to know how do you expect the landscape for investments in energy transition because it's not the in thing. You know, we've seen the goals for 2030. Those targets are there and Africa seems to be far behind. What do you expect the landscape for energy transition in Africa to? How do you see developing in the next couple of years? I see the landscape developing in a very positive light. Um, we're very high, high on it and we think that you know, many investors, as you, as you correctly stated, are rushing and trying to accelerate um, investments into the energy transition. In the context of Africa, we see that the continent actually has the op opportunity to leapfrog in terms of technology being invested in um, compared to, to other markets. So we're seeing opportunities in CNI. So an example could be a flour mill in the north of Nigeria before it used to have to regrow or rely on the grid to get its power. Now you have a more efficient way by you know, signing a power purchase agreement directly with the solar PV plant, um, and that would enable you to have cleaner energy and a lower cost. So we're seeing opportunities there. We're also seeing opportunities in the EV market. Um, and, and finally, we still think that there's going to be a lot of opportunity in just general renewables, whether it be solar, hydro, wind, uh, or biomass. And reasons for this is because Africa as a continent is blessed with so many resources that would enable for that type of investment. Thank you so much for that to me, Fire Me Investment Specialist 91, for sharing your perspective on Business Incorporated. Thank you so much. Now, moving on to Zimbabwe, where the central bank says it will maintain its tight monetary policy, though inflation has dropped to 18.4%. According to the Apex Bank Monetary Policy Committee, the central bank will take all action to firmly anchor inflation and exchange rate expectations. The MPC, which met on Tuesday, noted that monetary and financial conditions were conducive to sustain the prevailing stability given the robust robust economic growth of 5.3% expected in 2023, high foreign currency inflows relative to external payments and fiscal sustainability. Inflation in the country, we must note, has dropped from a peak of 175.8% in June to 18.4% this month. Now, South Sudan and Russia have agreed to bolster their energy cooperation, focusing primarily on the oil sector. This move serves as a testament to the strengthening bilateral ties between the two nations. This endeavor is expected to boost the oil industry in South Sudan, providing a significant push towards the African nation's economic development. The construction of this refinery also signifies Russia's growing influence and involvement in the African continent's energy sector. South Sudan's crude oil exports have climbed to the highest level in almost two years, despite an ongoing war in Sudan, estimates have shown last month. Now in Nigeria, the Federation Account Allocation Committee, FAC, has shared a total sum of 1.1 trillion naira as revenue to the federal government, states, and local government councils. In a state by the FAC, from the the 1.1 trillion uh, total distributable revenue, the federal government received a total of 431.2 billion naira. The state government received 361.1 billion naira, and the local government councils received 266.53 billion naira. Meanwhile, the balance in the excess crude account ECA was at 473,754.57 dollars. And that's a wrap on Business Incorporated for this week. It's the final edition, and I'm Will Ebon. Thanks for watching.